how big was Noah's flood? It's a really important question. What was the scale, the scope of Noah's flood? And we need to predominantly ask this question in terms of what does the Bible teach about the scale of Noah's flood? Not necessarily, you know, what does contemporary science think of the scale of Noah's flood? We'll get into, the, you know, the distinction of the sciences, the priority of the sciences, and all of that here in a moment. I want to say something about that before we really dig into the issues. Uh, but welcome to the Baptist Broadcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, podcast addict uh you know you name it we're there if you're watching on youtube please click the subscribe button down below and the bell for continued notifications gavin ortland a dear brother and a, a very helpful um teacher and uh and, and theologian uh has a youtube channel called truth unites uh, he recently published a video uh, titled, Was Noah's Flood Local? And throughout the course of that video, it's about 45 minutes long, something like that. He makes an argument that, uh, makes actually two main arguments, that Noah's Flood was local. Uh, that it was not a global event, that it was not, uh, the scope of Noah's Flood was not a, a, an event that encompassed the entirety of the globe, but that it was just a local flood that uh, nevertheless affected a large area or a large swath of the creation, particularly in the Middle East, uh, and uh, would have displaced anyone and everyone living in that location, animals, obviously people, uh, and that the only family that was preserved in that locale was Noah and his, and his family. And so uh, I wanted to interact with this video uh, for a couple of reasons. I, I do think that there are some important implications for taking the local flood position. Uh, that said, I don't want to come off in this video as if I am trying to imply or, or designate uh, Gavin as uh, a heretic or as someone who has departed from uh, Christian orthodoxy. We, we have to keep in mind that what makes a person a Christian is fundamentally the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what Gavin and I have in common. And so there's no desire here to make Gavin look bad. There's no desire to try and uh, denigrate him in terms of his character in any way. I just want to interact specifically with the claims that are made. I want to interact with with the, the doctrine here and not so much with the dude, if you know what I'm saying. And so I appreciate Gavin. I appreciate things that he has said and, and done on his channel. I, I, I found them to be very helpful. Gavin Orland is known for his uh, ironic attitude. He's, he's, he's interested in, in bringing peace to theological conversation. And I, and I really appreciate that about him. I think in, in an era of volatility and emotive responses, that's that kind of level-headed approach is, is very important. I was disappointed to see some of the reactions to uh, Gavin uh, on social media and elsewhere that, uh, you know, were just uh, condescending or they were intended to uh, just kind of dismiss the things that he said without any any sort of second take. Uh, you know, it's interesting to me that in, in over the last couple years, you know, we have really been enthralled in debates about the doctrine of God and about, you know, Christology and, you know, think about how fundamental those issues are. And it seems like, you know, there's there's not much interest in preserving the things that really matter, uh, you know, in terms of the doctrine of God, for example, or, or Christology, the doctrine of the Incarnation. Uh, and it seems like differences in those areas, you know, kind of just get a, an eye wink or maybe a, a shoulder shrug. Um but a difference in the area of Noah's flood and the extent of Noah's flood brings all the scrutiny and and all of the uh, you know uh, all of the uh, um, quarrelsomeness you could, you could imagine. It's it's very interesting, and I think it says a lot about the things that we prioritize in our theology. Not realizing, of course, that the doctrine of God is the most important. The doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Incarnation, those are things really worth defending and, and sticking our flag in and drawing lines over. Whereas, you know, the extent of Noah's flood is important. Like I said, I think there are theological conclusions that need to be, uh, or implications that need to be addressed. Uh, and, and there are things at stake uh, when we begin, I think, uh, pulling back from a, uh, believing in a global scale of the Noahic flood for, for various biblical reasons. Uh, 
that's not to say that, that Gavin has imbibed what I believe to be the consistent application of that position. I don't think that he has. In, in fact, I, I, I know from what he says that he has not. But I do think there are serious implications. That doesn't mean that everyone who affirms this view actually imbibes those implications or, or affirms those implications. Every theological error, and we all have errors, every theological error has horrible implications that not all of us would subscribe to. So I hope we can at least uh, show grace um, in that area. One of the things I want to begin by discussing before we jump into this, uh, the, the uh, you know, kind of the precursors of the, the prologue uh, kind of behind us now, is I want to talk about theological method. I, I think when we get into discussions like this, and now uh, Gavin's very clear that, you know, he's not letting science, he doesn't have an intention to let or allow science to, the natural sciences, like archaeology or, or, or geology, he doesn't want to let those things, you know, drive the interpretive boat. He, he begins his video desiring to come to his conclusions on the foundation of Scripture. Um, there's minimal scientific discussion that goes into Gavin's video, um, and, and I think it's for that reason. I mean, he, he actually wants to get his conclusions from, from Scripture. My concern is that when we bring up, um, when, you know, when we, when we start to talk about uh, theological positions or, 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 or theological beliefs that were not really affirmed, uh, generally, uh, prior to you know something like the Enlightenment or 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 even the Scientific Revolution, um, and and we begin we begin you know questioning whether or not the historical interpretation is true. I think the only the only way we could begin to ask those questions is because of you know various things going on within the natural sciences. Let's let's take evolution as an example. Um, theistic evolution, as it's conceived of today, um, y you can think of, you know, biologos and, you know, different, you know, kind of quasi-ministries that, that try to merge, you know, the, the contemporary discussion on, on biological evolution with, with Christian theology. You know, I, I don't think we would be asking those kinds of questions or coming to those kinds of conclusions if it weren't for what is being said within the natural scientific community. And so uh, my concern is that even though, you know, Gavin and, and many others who perhaps hold his view, even though they're not, they're not trying to take Scripture and jam it into, you know, the, the, the shoe of, of the science of archaeology or something like that, um, I, I can't help but think that there is, there is some import here from the natural scientific uh, field of study uh, as it contemporarily exists. And that concerns me because one of the things we want to do as Christians is we want to understand the proper distinction between the sciences. We want to understand that theology is the queen. Uh, we want to understand that each science speaks, you know, through its own principles and, 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 and has its own methodology that fits the, the principles um, and things like that. And so we, we, we don't want to, we want to give each science its place but we also don't want to blend the sciences such that, you know, one science begins driving the boat of, of another science, so to speak. So we don't want archaeology and the conclusions from, you know, contemporary archaeological studies to form our hermeneutic. We, we don't want that to, to, to form our hermeneutic. It can inform us. It can, you know, there are helpful ways in which I think... Um, the natural sciences illuminate divine realities, right? We have this thing called natural theology and general revelation and all of that. Um, so I'm, I don't want to to take away the reality of uh, kind of um, inter-science dialogue between theology and the lower sciences. But we do have to realize that, you know, theology is the queen of sciences, then you kind of have, you know, philosophy, and then under that it breaks, out, it breaks down into, you know, uh, science concerning specified being. Let me let me illustrate what I mean here. I, I have a diagram here. Um, one of I, I I've had a friend that I've discussed this with before, um, uh, and it was a very very helpful discussions. This was a, a couple of years ago, uh, maybe a year or two ago, 
uh, where we're talking about, you know, things like um, presuppositionalism and collapse of the sciences and, and how all of that kind of developed after the Enlightenment. And then I took a class um, that was taught by Dr. Dalzal, um, Philosophical Theology, and uh, in Philosophical Theology, he he gives a rendition of this, which is uh, the tree of the the tree of sciences, or we could call it the hierarchy of the sciences. And, and this is really something that we don't, I think, concentrate on enough today. It's something that has been lost to the annals of history, and so uh, a lot of confusion has arisen over the years because these distinctions aren't being made. But if you look at if you look at the um, the, the I guess chart or uh, kind of a flow chart. Theology is at the top because theology is the queen of the sciences. It, it, it derives its principles or, or it speaks from principles that are higher, uh, namely God himself and, and God's revelation. Those principles are higher than, you know, philosophy and, and mathematics and, you know, all this, the sciences down below that you see there, which are natural sciences. So you see theology at the top, and that and that gives it a place of preeminence, a place of uh, of authority. Um, then you see philosophy, philosophy dealing primarily with metaphysics or the the study of being qua being. Under that is is kind of the second order of knowledge, which is called mathematics, uh, deals with logic, and then also you know formal symbolic math and things like that. But under that you have specified sciences based on specified being, and 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 what I mean by specified being is, you know, chemistry is not philosophy because philosophy studies all being if I could put it that way it studies being in general whereas chemistry studies being as it's you know confined to an analysis of chemicals right and uh, physics studies being as it's confined to you know the natural world and how uh, things mass and things interact with various universal laws uh, in creation. Biology obviously deals with being specified to life. Psychology being specified to the mind. Anthropology specified to being specified to man. Astronomy being specified to the luminary bodies and things of that nature. And, and of course, anatomy uh, dealing with, you know, physiology and things like that. So this, this flow chart, this kind of chart of hierarchical chart of the sciences, I think is very important because what we don't want to do is we don't want to take something like chemistry or something like archaeology uh, or even something like natural history and, 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 and derive theological conclusions from the Bible, but, but based on those, on those particular sciences. Uh, or what's being said with in relation to those particular sciences. Uh, another important distinction is to distinguish between the science itself and the studies or or what people are saying that work in that particular field of study or that work in relation to that particular science. So uh, the scientific community, you know, in the 19th century uh, was not saying about virology what you know scientists in the 21st century are saying about virology and the and the point is that our knowledge of these particular areas of study um, changes because we realize that we were wrong and this is the whole thing with you know hypothesis and experiment the whole idea with experimentation is to test and hypothesis. Uh, and once that hypothesis is 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 falsified by experimentation, you know, a new hypothesis needs to be developed. And this is what happens over and over again, generation to generation within the natural sciences. Theology is not developed that way um, because theology has a set of principles that um, that are 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 different um, than the principles uh, of biology, for example. Um, theology is dealing with the highest being, that is God himself, um, and this God, we believe as Christians, has spoken to us through his word. And so this automatically means, because we have direct revelation from God in the scriptures, that theology as a science must be queen. The other thing that I want to say before we move on from this is... Um, it is assumed that there can be no real contradiction between the science of biology, for example, 
and the science of theology. So even though theology and biology have two distinct formal principles, there's material overlap. And the reason that there's material overlap is because, well, Scripture says something about man. Scripture says something about sexual relations between man and woman, for example. Um, and biology has a lot to say about that. And the assumption of the Christian is that while theology is supreme, um, and, and biology is to be seen in light of theology, it's also the case that you know a discovery in biology is never going to contradict theology, and theology is never going to contradict true biology. Um, and so if we come to a conclusion in biology, or if we come to a conclusion in archaeology, that would contradict the biblical narrative, for example, or that would contradict clear theological principia, uh, to, to name another example, then we would, ha we, we would be forced not to revise or compromise on the doctrine of Scripture. And I'm not saying that's what Gavin's doing, by the way. But we would be forced to actually revise our conclusions concerning the biological sciences or the archaeological sciences. All right, so that's kind of how the sciences interplay. I think that's very important to, to understand because inadvertently, again, I'm not accusing Gavin of doing anything uh, that uh, along the lines of, of purposeful compromise or anything like that. Um, but because uh, the distinction between the sciences, the hierarchy of the sciences, usually is not being assumed by any of us in this 21st century, uh, then inadvertently we can, we can confuse these two things. Uh, you know, the lower sciences with the higher sciences. And uh, so that's something I want to avoid, and, and that's something I thought I would just interject into this conversation. Again, not saying even that Gavin is making that mistake. I'm not. But in a conversation like this, and, and particularly in conversations that revolve around, you know, uh, creationism, <clears throat> and, um, you know, here, uh, the scope of Noah's flood, these conversations that, that, that also speak something to uh, you know, various uh, scientific, lower scientific disciplines like archaeology and, and you know, origin of species and things of that ma manner, uh, we have to be very careful that we do not get the hierarchy of sciences out of balance or out of the hierarchy. All right, so that I, that's a long preface. I understand uh, this is going to be a longer video in case you haven't noticed, um, but I just wanted to say that at the outset, and ho hopefully that's, that's helpful. Let's get into Gavin's arguments. He, he makes two main arguments um, in his podcast titled, Why Was Noah's Flood Local? And I'm going to deal mostly with these two main arguments and, and of course, some sub points that I've summarized that, that he makes within each of these broader arguments. And um, he the final part of the, the video uh, has some useful information because he's actually defending the historicity of the flood. So I'm, I'm not going to interact so much with that. I'm going to interact with the, the lion's share of the video, which is taken up with these two arguments. The first argument is from biblical language. And then the second argument is uh, what he calls multiplying miracles. And so we're going to look first at his argumentation from biblical language. Now, all of the, the both of these arguments break down into, you know, smaller arguments and, and you know, claims that he makes throughout these two sections. So really, we could call these sections. And within each of these sections, he makes um, several claims and and uh, multiple arguments, um, it, you know, in, in a way that's that's very polished and and understandable, as is uh, as is um, uh, Gavin's uh, uh, custom, which which is very much appreciated. So, the first thing uh, we're going to look at arguments from biblical language, or the first argument from biblical language, and the first thing really that that Gavin brings up, and and the thing he spends quite a bit of time on, is the term kol eretz in the Hebrew, which is, uh, you know, like something like the whole world, uh, if we were to translate that. So he, he's dealing with this term, like what, what does this mean? What, what, is the, what is the scope of the whole world within the context of Noah's flood? Um, and, and sometimes we take this universal language, especially in the Old Testament, and we we, we over-realize it, um, and so sometimes there's language in the Old Testament that, you know, would translate to everlasting or eternal or forever, and we say, well, that's forever uh, and at all times, and, and it's, it's universally the case that from that point on forevermore that this or that is going to be the case. And there's statements 
uh, in, in the Old Testament where that's just not true. Even though the universal term is used, it's not true that, you know, whatever that term was was ascribed to actually goes on forever and ever and ever ad infinitum, you know, without, without end. Um, and so we want to be careful to understand that these terms, while perhaps lexically they are universal um, at some level, that ultimately context has to define them. And so, you know, Gavin is, is wrestling with that, and, and rightfully so, and he's, and he's basically saying, you know, kol eretz, the, you know, the whole earth, um, that language in, 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 uh, in Genesis, um, uh, you know, Genesis 8 uh, and Genesis 7, you know, that th this language doesn't necessarily have to mean the whole globe. And oftentimes what we do is we read language like whole earth and we automatically assume that the whole globe is in the crosshairs of that statement. And I think it's right for, for Gavin to, to, to make that qualification because it's a very important you know, hermeneutical tool that as we in interpret the Bible, you know, we're going to run across language that to our modern ears you know, seems to necessitate some kind of universal or, or eternally lasting thing. But really these terms have to be defined by context. So essentially what he's saying is kol eretz, you know, whole earth, often has a local context in scripture. And he gives several examples in scripture where kol eretz or whole earth is, you know, contextually constrained, where, you know, there's certain areas in scripture where kol eretz cannot mean the whole globe. It would have to mean, you know, the whole empire or the whole nation or the whole of the visible land seen, the whole land. Right, and so um, it, it doesn't mean whole Earth in every single case. Um, so even though it's, you know, lexically it might be the case that that it's it's a universal term by itself, it has to be understood based on the context. And and Gavin's thrust here is that the context of you know Genesis um, six through ten or so, uh, Genesis six through yeah, let's say Genesis six through nine or the six through ten really necessitates that we understand this kol eretz terminology as, as, as being bound or contextualized by a locality. Um, now, I'm going to disagree with that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back against that, but that's, that's the argument, that's the direction that, uh, that Gavin's going. Again, staying with this, this first argument, this, the second thing that he says is, is uh, something along the lines of, uh, of those living at the time, uh, would have had more of a primitive understanding of the earth. And so essentially what he's wanting to do is he's, he's wanting to, uh, to say that um, the biblical authors, uh, and if we take Moses to be the biblical author of, of, of Genesis, would not have had a full-scale understanding of the world as we have it today. And so all of this language needs to be understood in terms of their known world, their known land, all right? And so when Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses whole earth, he means the whole earth that he then knew, right? Or the whole earth that he understood, the whole earth that, um, that he took to be the known world at the time. And so for that reason, you know, we, should, we shouldn't have any problem According to Gavin, we shouldn't have any problem thinking that this is a local flood event. I, I mean, the biblical authors could only know so much about the world. Um, and so, whole earth, you know, that language, uh, only intends a, a, a local region. Now, at this point, he puts a lot of weight, and he follows um, Michael Heiser here. Um, he puts a lot of weight on the local scope of Genesis 10. So, in Genesis 10, uh, what's being described there? is uh, it, it's often called the table of nations but what's being de what's being described in Genesis 10 is the nations that um, uh, that occur after um, let's see here I'm trying to find out where I'm at here let's do this uh, the nations that occur after uh, after the flood and so you know Genesis 10 1, 10 1 says now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah Shem Ham and Japheth and sons were being and sons were born to them after the flood. So, what Heiser and Ortland would want to say, uh, I believe, just based on my hearing of the episode, and that episode's available on YouTube if you want to go listen to it for yourself, um, is that since 
chapter 10 really only deals with this regional locality, you know, and all the nations that are mentioned that come from Noah's descendants all are pretty much confined to uh, the Mesopotamic area, region. Um, that therefore, we should understand the context of the flood to, to be confined to uh, that area, roughly. The problem with that is that, obviously, chapter 10 follows the flood, and chapter 10 is describing the localities of Noah's sons after the flood. So, of course, if the whole world was destroyed, you know, and, uh, and the only eight remaining human beings get off the ark uh, and begin to reproduce and spread out, of course they're going to be confined to a more local region. So, you know, this is coming after the flood. I don't think it can act as a pretext for uh, the actual flood narrative and 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 the geography, uh, you know, of the flood itself. Um, so I, it's just odd to me why they would go to Genesis 10 and say, well, Genesis 10 uh, should be the context when Genesis 10 is uh, the nations after the flood, right? So we, we can't really understand the scope of civilization before the flood by looking at Genesis 10, which is describing the nations after the flood, all right? So I think that that would be a mistake to do that. Um, the other thing that comes up under this, this, this first argument from biblical language uh, is actually the Nephilim, interestingly enough, which I, I find the Nephilim discussion a, a very interesting discussion. And, and, and there are some things that, that concern the Nephilim and the giants and things like that, uh, you know, the sons of God and the daughters of men, that, that baffle me to this day. I, I have not come to a solid theological conclusion uh, on, on some of those passages. And so, you know, the, the identity of the giants. Now, I think there's some there's some, there are some positions historically with some explanatory force out there that I, I am interested in, uh, but I would not positionalize myself in them necessarily. And I'm going to, I'm going to use some of those. I'm going to look at some of those, uh, soon here. Um, but without saying too much, I, I think there, there's, there's an answer to this, but the, the objection here is, or the argument is that the Nephilim, are mentioned in Genesis 6, but then they appear again in, in Numbers 13. And kind of the overall claim here is that, well, it makes more sense um, for the flood to be local, if that's the case. In other words, if, if the Nephilim reappear in Numbers 13, you know, they're on the earth, uh, then they had to be living somewhere during the flood, right? Uh, they had to be you know they had to survive the flood somehow, and so I don't think it's the case that they that they swam around uh, and just kind of tread water for for a year or, or something like that before the flood waters recede. Um, no, the the local flood proponent would say, well, one of the attractive uh, uh, suggestions here uh, to explain this would be that you know the flood was local, and. Therefore, there's no problem in explaining why there's Nephilim in, Gen in Genesis 6 before the flood and Nephilim after the flood in Numbers 13. Okay, and so I'm going to respond to that in my own place. Uh, we'll look at that in a moment. Another thing that Gavin says, uh, and he's he's quoting from a YouTube channel uh, called Inspiring Philosophy, and he actually just clips a video onto his own. Uh, and so the person who runs Inspiring Philosophy is, is talking at this point in the video. And, and Inspiring Philosophy claims there is a contradiction between Genesis uh, 8, 5 and, um, and Genesis 8, 8 through 9. And we can throw verse 13 in there as well. Um, so the contradiction would be, uh, if I could just try to explain it uh, briefly here, um, that in Genesis 8... Five, it says, and the waters decrease continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Okay, so the tops of the mountains were seen at this point, but but down in, in verses 8 through 9, it says, He also sent out from himself a dove, Noah sent a dove out, to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. Verse 9, but the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put his hand on, he put his hand and took her, he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. So 
the allegation here by inspiring philosophy, which Gavin seconds, is that there's a contradiction between these two texts. If we are going with a universal flood narrative, the contradiction is this, that the mountains on the one hand were, were, were seen, that they were exposed because the water had receded. But on the other hand, this dove had no resting place, right? And it says that the waters were on the face of the whole earth still in verses eight, uh, nine, in verses eight through nine. Uh, I don't understand. Now, I'm, I only heard a part of Inspiring Philosophy's video, the, the part that, that Gavin um, clipped onto his own video. And so I'm not exactly how uh, that individual gets to the conclusion that this is a contradiction. Um, there are details that are, are different uh, between verse five and verses eight through nine that would suggest there's there's no contradiction whatsoever. I mean, on the one hand, the mountains are starting to be seen, and, and presumably that's at a distance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, in verses 8 through 9, uh, the waters were still uh, on the face of the ground, right? So obviously that means that, you know, there was some higher land mass that had been exposed at some point that's perhaps visible from the ark, uh, and then there's lower land mass where the water is still obviously covering it. And so there's no contradiction there. The only other contradiction would be that there's exposed land mass, but on the other hand, there's there's no place for the dove to, to set her foot. Well, if you've ever been around mountains, um, you'll know that sometimes you see mountains, you know, and you can see the shadow in the distance and they're, they're miles off, depending on the size of the mountain. Um, and, and that would be, you know, too far when there's only water between you know, the ark and that distant mountaintop uh, for a single dove to fly. Um, and so I don't, I don't think there's any contradiction there. Um, that's kind of a minor point in, in, in the video. I don't think, I mean, there's not a whole lot hinging on, on that argument, but I digress. Um, the last thing that, that, that Gavin brings up in the first argument is uh, kind of the historicity of the, of the, um, uh, of a localized flood, like is there anyone in history that that pays credence to uh, a localized flood event? And I was kind of surprised at this point in the video because usually uh, Gavin is is thoroughly immersed in historical uh, source material, and it seems like the only source that he was able to turn to was Josephus. And what G what Josephus does have to say is is doubtful at best as to whether or not he was lending credence to a local flood. Um, Josephus doesn't, uh, I'll, I'll actually read the quote uh, from Gavin. Um, what Josephus actually says is, is, is the following, and uh, to wait for, uh, let's see here. He says, the sons of Nakos, by which he means Noah, the sons of Nakos being, being three, oops, hold on a minute. The sons of Nakos being three, Simas and uh, Eophthas and Kamas, who were born a hundred years before the flood, were the first who came down from the mountains into the plains and made their dwelling there. And they were others, uh, so Josephus is saying there were others, who were very much afraid because of the deluge, because of the flood, and who were hesitant to descend from lofty places to take courage and to follow their example. That's it. From, from Josephus, and he's quoting that from a secondary source, C. John Collins, uh, page 193 of Reading Genesis Well. Uh, and so I was kind of surprised, because that's not a very clear reference to a local flood event. Um, you know, it, it could just be, and this is there's so much ambiguity here, you, it could just be referring to Noah's son's wives. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be referring to... Uh, to other people aside from the family uh, of Noah. So it's just a very kind of ambiguous citation I wouldn't take to be uh, constituting, you know, historical precedent or anything like that. So um, th that's kind of the last point on uh, in the first section, in, in the first argument, uh, really arguing from biblical language mainly that kol eretz, um, contextual, uh, terminology needs to be understood in light of surrounding language, in light of surrounding verses. Uh, what does whole earth mean? Does it just does it just mean the the whole land that we possess? Does it just mean the whole land that we can see? Does it just mean the whole land that we can know about? Or does it mean 
the globe, all right? And so that's an important consideration. I join with Gavin in saying, yeah, we need to consider that. Uh, I'm going to disagree here in a moment uh, when I when I go through some counter arguments. Um, but I do think it's 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 worth asking. Uh, the second argument is from multiplying miracles, and we'll just go through these uh, more briefly because I'm not going to spend as much time, uh, y- you know, trying to, attempting to counter some of these. Uh, because these are these are pretty simple. Uh, the, the overall premise of this argument is that um, you know the more the more unspecified miracle you need to explain something in scripture, it, it probably means that it's the it's 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 less and less probable. Um, so if you find yourself okay, so let's say there's a um, a biblical the flood. All right. So if you find yourself having to insert various miracles that enable your version of the flood to happen, uh, and these miracles are not in the text itself, uh, then chances are this is not a probable view of the flood. All right. So his his whole his whole thing here is, if you find yourself having to multiply miracles that are not in the text of scripture itself in order to explain your conclusion from the text of scripture. It, it may be the case then that it's not you, you haven't come to a valid conclusion about what the scripture is saying. All right, so some things that he mentions here are like, you know, the transportation of animals is a big one. This is one that stands out for everybody, and even those who hold to a, a, a global flood narrative will think about the transportation of animals, right? Like if you're if you're thinking about like how did how did all these animals get from different places in the in, in the world to the ark. Number one, how did they know to do that? Uh, you know, number two, how did they, you know, if they had to traverse, you know, bodies of water and things like that and and they didn't fly, you know, like how, how could they do that? Um, and so all of these questions arise whenever you're thinking about, you know, Noah's Ark and you're thinking about the geography of the world and, and things like that. So, you know, this is one area where a person might be tempted to invent some miracles to, to, to make it happen. You know, if you take the global flood view, uh, you may be tempted at this point to say, well, there's, you know, there's just, uh, it's just miraculous the way that God got them all there. And we can't explain it, but it just, it just happened. Well, you would be inserting a miracle into the text that's not in the text in order to explain your understanding of the text. And what Gavin's saying is that would be exegetically fallacious. Um, So, Again, the, the the first you know miracle that would have to be inserted is is this transportation of animals, getting all these animals you know from distant places to the ark. It seems far fetched to those who take a local flood view. Uh, the second one is the number of animals on the ark. Um, it would require uh, so like there are several things here. You know, could the ark even accommodate so many animals? Um, uh, it would require lightning speed, to use Gavin's language, it would require lightning speed evolution after the departure from the ark. So once the ark landed, the waters receded, the animals got off the ark. To get all the species and things that we have today would require lightning fast evolution from that point on to get us to today with the variation of species that we that we see around us. So how could that many animals have been on the ark? Um, it's, you know, it's difficult to imagine, you know, some would say. Uh, it would multiply miracles that that are not found in the text. In other words, you would have to say, well, there's just some miraculous way that God did this, but the text doesn't say there's some miraculous way that God did this. So, uh, you know, um, Gavin would say that it would be questionable as to whether or not we could do that. Um, the care for the animals on the ark. Uh, you know, one of the things that Gavin says, you've ever been to a zoo, it takes an immense amount of care to care for the animals in the zoo. And here you're talking about a scale of, of, of animals that's larger than your local zoo. Um, and so you, you you have this immense logistical project on your hands. Uh, but then he talks about like polar bears and koalas, like, like, you know, saying that the immensity of the operation here would entail, you know, caring for polar bears, which have a very, you know, specific environmental um, uh, kind of uh, requirement. Uh, koalas would have a very specific environmental envir- uh, requirement and so it would be very difficult to take care of these different species on on the boat but before that Gavin you know kind of rightly describing the um, you know position of the global flood many would say that you know these were just kinds uh, 
taken onto the ark. The, these weren't every species of of animal. These were just kinds. So like you have a dog kind and then you have a bear kind. It wouldn't be every single species of bear. It wouldn't be every single species of dog. It wouldn't be every single species of fish, right? You would just have generic kinds or families, pairs, that would be brought onto the ark, minimizing the count of animals that you actually need on the ark, uh, and therefore minimizing the care that would be required for each of these animals on the ark. But then to 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 criticize to criticize that position, Gavin starts talking about polar bears and koalas. Well, those would be those would be species of a more generic family pair. So, um, not sure why he does that. We'll we'll we'll. Uh, We'll kind of pass over that, but just I, I just wanted to make note uh, of that. I, I thought it was an inconsistency in the way he was drawing criticisms. Um, the amount of water is another one. Where did all this water come from? If, like, how could everything be, how could all the earth be covered with water? Uh, and today we, we don't have, obviously we don't have enough water to cover the whole earth, right? So, like, you know, the oceans are fixed in their locations. They're not transgressing the boundaries of, you know, beaches and levees and things like that. And, uh, and there's not enough water in the sky, uh, to create, you know, the, all the floodwaters needed to cover something like Mount Everest. And so where did all the water come from? You know, that would be, and, and some may be tempted to say, well, you know, God just created the water, you know, at, out of, uh, out of out of thin air, so to speak, and uh, it was a miracle, right? Well, the text doesn't say that, so Gavin would say, "Well, you can't. I don't know if you can really do that." Okay, uh, the survival of plants and trees. I think there's an easy solution to this one, but this is one of the criticisms. You know, how did how did trees and plants survive? How did sea animals survive alongside freshwater animals? You know, if, if sea animals have to live in salt water and freshwater animals have to live in fresh water, uh, and those two waters come together you know, uh, the freshwater becoming contaminated with salinity. How, how did the freshwater animals live in salt water and vice versa? That kind of thing. So, you know, again, you would have to posit a miracle to, it is thought, to, to avoid, you know, that kind of awkward conclusion. Okay, so those are, those are the arguments. Um, and I think if you go back to the, you know, I'm not playing the video and responding to every little thing that he says. I, I found that to be incredibly time consuming. And, um, and so I'm not doing this video like that. Um, but if you have, if you do have the time, you can go back and, and watch Was Noah's Flood Local by Gavin Ortland on Truth Unites and, and, and double check, you know, my characterization of his arguments. I, of course, want to be fair uh, to what he's saying and, and, and hopefully I'm representing him well. So if you would like to go back and, uh, and watch what he says, his video is only 46 minutes long, um, then, then please go and do that. Our video is going to be quite a bit longer because uh, I'm just now getting the counter arguments here. And then after counter arguments, we'll have to look uh, at some things. Um, I want to do a, a section on constructive theology um, where we kind of look at the flood constructively. We're not really criticizing Gavin or, or, or rebutting any of his arguments. We'll just be uh, kind of developing a theology of the flood um, from Scripture. So, but first, we, we need to look at counter-arguments. Um, these counter-arguments are organized in the same order that I went through Gavin's original argumentation. All right, so we're going to begin with uh, a counter to the first argument. Um, we need to make some contextual observations about the biblical terminology. Uh, and I, I, my counter-argument to Gavin's first argument is that he's missing some details um, that is, I think, skewing what he thinks about the universality or the lack of universality concerning the flood. And so I want to try to add some details to the biblical language that didn't show up in Gavin's video. I, I, I don't know why they didn't show up in Gavin's video. I, I would assume that, you know, the man only has so much time on his hands. And so... Um, uh, I, I just, maybe hopefully this will actually just serve to advance uh, the conversation. But beginning with the issue of coal erets, again, whole earth language or, or whole world, but actually the mo more legitimate translation of coal erets would be whole land or whole earth. All right. So uh, world would be uh, to, uh, 
involved, I think. Um, so Cole Eretz, that term has to be contextually understood. And Gavin understands this. He actually made mention of that in his video, that it, that it needs to be determined by context. It needs to be understood within context. Um, Michael Heiser understands that. He grants that. I, I don't think they do justice to the context, though. Um, because the text that they end up going to, like Genesis 10, for example, to, to contextualize whole earth, um, is, is jumping over leaps and bounds language that you encounter, you know, back in Genesis 7 and Genesis 8, that has to condition our understanding of, of what the whole earth is. Um, so for example, there are two ways whole earth is used. This is one of Gavin's points that, uh, you know, Cole Eretz is uh, sometimes used for a, a local, a, a locality, a local uh, event, local place. Um, and so it doesn't mean the whole world. One example of that would be Exodus 10, 15. It refers to the locust plague there in Egypt. According to verse 14, it says that um, uh, in Exodus 15, it says over all the land of Egypt, uh, or in, in Exodus 10, 14, it says over all the land in Egypt, uh, of Egypt, right? So in, in verse 14, we're told that this locust plague was over all the land in Egypt, of Egypt. But then in verse 15, it says they covered the face of the earth. Kol Eretz, right? Uh, or they covered, they covered the face of the earth, uh, Eretz, at least Eretz. Um, but, but the insinuation there, it's the same language that we find in Genesis, over the face of, Eretz over the face of the earth, and so it would seem to insinuate that, well, if you take earth, you know, in, in a modern understanding, you'd say, oh, that's a whole globe, you know, so this must this must mean that the locusts were all over the place. Well, no, it, it doesn't mean that. It just means that they were over all the land of Egypt. The earth that was then observable is what played host to these locusts. Um, but elsewhere, so we, so we know that the language of earth, Eretz, we know that, you know, Cole Eretz, uh, Gavin gives plenty of examples where Cole Eretz is necessarily constrained to a locality. But elsewhere in Scripture, like Psalm 97, 5, uh, you know, we're told that Cole Eretz is, is universal in scope. So uh, we're told, for example, that God is Lord of the whole earth, right? And so that must be the whole earth. That must be the whole globe. Um if we're going to look at the near context, and I think that's what's important, we're going to look at the near context, we're going to look at the broader context. But if we're to look at the near context, Genesis 9.19 says the whole earth was populated by the sons of Noah, right? So uh, we know that the sons of Noah go forth and they, they begin to have, you know, offspring. And we're told in Genesis 9.19 9.19 that the whole earth is populated by, by, by Noah's sons. Um, and then in chapter 11, verse one, we read the whole earth had one language and one speech. Now we're getting into the Babel narrative, right? So the whole earth had one language and one speech in verse four of chapter 11, the concern of those at the tower of Babel was that they would be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, right? And so this seems, this terminology of whole earth I don't think can be, you know, constrained to one particular regional locality. I think that there's a, a global insinuation here, or at least uh, an insinuation of of all that is earth, right? <clears throat> all that can be lived upon, all that can be uh, walked upon, that kind of thing. When we get to the broader, so I think even in the near context of the flood narrative, you see a, a scope that is larger, unless we also want to say that the Babel narrative is constrained to a locality and that the, that the Tower of Babel did not scatter uh, the families of the earth to, to the four winds, right? But we, we, we just want to say that they were scattered locally. I don't, I don't think that's the case, and, and I'm not sure Gavin would want to go there. But if we look at the broader context as well, God is called the Lord of the whole earth in Psalm 97, 5. In Isaiah 6, 3, the whole earth is full of the glory of Yahweh. That's Kol Eretz. Uh, Isaiah 54, 5, God is God of the whole earth, Kol Eretz. Again, th these are universal significations. So th these, uh, this term can be, can be applied universally or locally, but I think even in the near context of, you know, Genesis 6 through 10, you see whole earth applied in a way that would insinuate something larger 
going on uh, in scope. Um, and I think what the scriptures are inviting us to do is uh, is it's inviting us to to understand Noah as a, a kind of new Adam, and from Noah all the families of the earth will be descended. If we go with the you know kind of the deluge view of the flood, that is kind of a, a deconstruction and a reconstruction of the creation, all at the same time, a recreation, if you will, which I think is exactly what we're supposed to conclude about the flood. Um, I think that would insinuate a global scope. Not to mention humanity and how humanity, all those born in Adam, how they must be affected by the flood. It would seem disproportionate and inconsistent to say that some who are born in Adam, in the first Adam, some who are born in the first Adam are not affected by the flood. Um, apart from Noah's family, of course. But it would, wouldn't it seem awkward to say all those who were born in the first Adam who have gone on from the first Adam and who have devolved uh, as as sons of Satan, essentially, uh, to this point that we get to Genesis 6, and, and, and now God's judgment through deluge becomes necessary because of the wickedness over the face of the earth. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be awkward to say that, uh, yeah, well, actually, some of the sons of Adam who were wicked didn't get touched by the flood because they lived outside the boundaries of where the flood happened. I don't think that works. I think if we understand Noah as a second Adam, which we'll, we'll get to that more here in a minute, we have to understand the flood as, as being globally significant or, or, or at least significant in all the places where man is significant and where man lives and where every creeping thing lives, right? Um, the other thing that I want to note here uh, on the term coal erets Gavin spends a lot of time on the language of kolorets. It's not the only only universal word used in the text. Um, it, it, so even if we were to say, well, kolorets has local significations in, in other places in Scripture, okay, fine, granted. What about the other universal terminology in Genesis 6 through 10? So, you know, for example, um, God says in Genesis 6, 7, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Man. Is he just talking about, you know, man in this ge geographical vicinity? Or is he talking about all those who were born in Adam except Noah and his family? I would destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. That's Genesis 6, 7, right? Uh, or Genesis 6, 13. The end of all flesh has come before me. The end of all flesh has come before me, right? So we have to explain that universal terminology as well. Um, Genesis 7, 4, I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. He ties it back to his creation. And so if God has made it, if it's living flesh, it's gone, except for what is preserved in the ark. Um, and, and there's a beautiful parallel here to, you know, the future judgment where God is going to judge all those who are not preserved in the ark of Jesus Christ who is our gospel, right? The, the ark is is the gospel, essentially. Or we, to say it another way, the gospel is the other greater ark, you know, this kind of typological aspect here of the Noahic flood. And so you have to deal with the other universal terms, not just kol erets. Kol erets is just one universal term out of many uh, in, in Genesis 6 through 10. And so those have to be dealt with as well. So, you know, just concluding here, this counter argument to, to Gavin's first argument, um, particularly as he's interacting with Colorette's, you know, whole earth. Um, you know, I, I think we have to conclude that Noah was um, a new Adam. I, I think that the, the flood has to be larger than a regional locality unless, you know, I think we have to understand Col Eretz as universal, actually, in terms of how it's being employed in this passage. Unless we want to understand Babel as a, a local-only event as well, because Babel is also said to spread uh, across the whole face of the earth. So, uh, you know, again, here this goes with some implication. I, I said at the beginning that there are some far-reaching implications here. I mean, if we topple the global scale of the flood, then we have to topple the global scale of uh, Babel as well. And so, uh, but I don't think we can do that. Uh, I, I and I, I don't know if if Gavin would want to do that either. Um, 
you know, one of, one of Gavin's points under the first argument, you know, those living at the time would have had a primitive understanding of the earth to include only a ge the geographical region pertinent to the table of nations in Genesis 10. Well, what I would want to say to that is we don't limit the meaning of the text to the human author. I don't think we should. Uh, the primitive understanding of the human author is not an argument to limit meaning to the cognitive periphery of the human author. Uh, we know God knows a lot more about the world than Moses knew. And so, um, I don't think everything has to be evaluated in Scripture in terms of human perspective. Um, I think we have to take into account that there's a divine author here, and that not everything should be limited to the cognitive periphery of the human author, as limited as it is. Um, the, the hermeneutic of the New Testament certainly doesn't do this. I mean, you look at Hebrews 1.5 and how it interprets, you know, 2 Samuel 7.14, uh, you know, the typology of Solomon and, and Jesus and so on. And, and, and there are all sorts of places in the New Testament where, uh, you know, meaning is not limited to, for example, the Old Testament human author. It, it's often understood that there's fuller meaning to be expounded in the New Testament. And so I, I think we ought to follow that. I think we ought to understand that. Um, you know, one of the notes that I have here is, you know, in, in, in what sense, if, if we're to, if we're to under, if we're to constrain all this universal terminology to the human, human author, to the limited understanding of the human author, in other words, if the human author only knows a segment of the world, then that therefore the flood must be confined to that segment. Um, like, in what sense is all flesh destroyed by the flood? Genesis 9.15. If the flood was local, right, if the flood was local and not all humanity and animals were destroyed, then it seems any local flood that occurs today, wherein people are killed, would be a recap of the Noahic flood. Wouldn't it? I mean, any flood that would result in the death of humans and animals would be a recapitulation of the Noahic Flood. But within the very context, say when we get to Genesis 9, God tells us that he will never flood the earth like he did uh, in the Noahic Flood. And so I think we have to understand something different here with the Noahic Flood, something that differentiates it from any other flood that goes on today. There have been some pretty massive floods in, in recent history that have killed both beast and man. And I don't think those are recaps of the Genesis flood, because God said he would never flood the earth that way again, right? So that's that's a little bit of a side trail, but it's a note that I wanted to bring up. Uh, you know, if if the Genesis flood was local, what, dis what really meaningfully distinguishes it from any local flood today? Uh, and if it's not distinguished from any local flood today, then would not that mean that God has broken his own promise never to flood the earth that way again? So I think that the, the global scale of the Noahic Flood distinguishes it from a local flood today where some die and some live. Essentially, if we want to say that the Noahic Flood is local, then we would just say the same thing that we could say about any other flood today. It'd just be on a larger scale. You know, some died and some lived. Um, it was a catastrophic event, but, uh, you know, in the end, people people recovered and, you know, built civilization back and things like that. Um, I, I, I don't think I don't think we're uh, able to say that. I think there has to be something that meaningfully and substantially distinguishes the Noahic flood from, you know, floods that happen today. Not just in terms of scale, but in terms of the nature of the event, right? And and that would be its global scope. Um, the Nephilim uh, argument, you know, where he says uh, the Nephilim are mentioned in Genesis 6 before the flood and reappear in Numbers 13 after the flood. You know, Gavin himself says he, he, he doesn't want to put a lot of weight on that. He offers it uh, really uh, to those who may be interested. I, I, I want to kind of stay on this for a little bit because it is something that someone may look at and say, well, if there are Nephilim in Genesis 6, before the flood, and Nephilim in number 13, after the flood, then pff, obviously the flood had to be local. Well, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's, I don't think that's as obvious as it, would, as, it would might, as it might first appear. And the reason for that, I'm going to bring some history to bear here. Um, 
there's a slide I, I did here of, of uh, Cole Eretz, Genesis 8 9. I didn't bring this up. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Clement of Alexandria. We're going to look at Clement of Alexandria. We're going to look at Tertullian. We're going to look at Philo on this. Um, there are other explanations that can explain the continuation of the Nephilim after the flood. Um, for example, we could ask the question, were one of Noah's sons' wives Nephilim? Or at least Nephilim in descent, such that she might have a recessive gene or something like that, right? Maybe she was way taller than him. Who knows? The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, it's a possible explanation. Um, what about fallen angels procreating with human women? Um, now, I know that this gives people the heebie-jeebies, and, and, and people don't like to talk about this, but there's historical precedent here. Again, this is one of those areas I said at the beginning, I, I'm not taking a position here. Um, I, I do think it can serve as an explanation, though. Uh, I'm not saying I, I buy into the position, but it can or could explain why there are Nephilim in Genesis 6 and then Nephilim again in Numbers 13. Okay, uh, so let's um, let's look at this a little bit a little bit more because uh, this is a this is a hinge point for some people. Uh, those who hold to the theory of angelically created Nephilim include Philo, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian. Um, Maastricht, Maastricht, uh, Peter Van Maastricht disagrees with all three of them. By the way, uh, so I grant that there has been a uh, diversity of opinions in the tradition. Um, in theoretical practical theology, you'll see in volume three, uh, page 229, he he cites Philo, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian as those who would uh, affirm some kind of angel romance with human women. Uh, Maastricht disagrees with them, which is fine. There's Again, there's diversity in the tradition and how this text is handled. Um, but one of the things that Clement of Alexandria says is this, and we showed in the first miscellany that the philosophers of the Greeks are called thieves, inasmuch as they have taken without acknowledgment their principal dogmas from Moses and the prophets, to which also we shall add that the angels who had obtained the superior rank, having sunk into pleasures, told to the women and told to the women the secrets which had come to their knowledge, while the rest of the angels concealed them, or rather kept them against the coming of the Lord. So there he's kind of making a favorable argument for uh, Greek philosophy as, as being influenced by Moses, but then what he's saying is that, uh, you know, essentially um, secrets had been told to these women uh, by these fallen angels um, uh, they who sunk into pleasures. It was their lusts for these women uh, that ended them ended them in this in this sunken estate, this this fallen estate, and they communicated with these women the secrets which had come to their knowledge, which while the rest of the angels concealed them, or rather kept them against the coming of the Lord. Uh, and so there you have a, a tip of the hat by Clement of Alexandria that there was some kind of you know romantic, as odd as that is to say, some kind of carnal relationship between angels and and fallen angels and uh, the daughters of men. Uh, another person speaking to this is Tertullian. He says, those angels, the desert, the deserters from God, the lovers of women were likewise the discoverers of this curious art of idolatry on that account also condemned by God. So here he's talking about idols, uh, idolatry, the formation of idols and things like that. He's saying that all comes from these fallen angels. Um, these fallen angels were lovers of women uh, and so, again, there's this kind of sensual relationship between angels and women in, in the history. Um, and then the last one is is Philo. Philo says this. Now, Philo is a Jewish uh, philosopher, so he's not a Christian, but this is nevertheless an, uh, an, an early take on the giants uh, in Genesis 6. And he says, And when the angels of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, they took unto themselves wives of, of all of them whom they chose. Those beings whom other philosophers call demons, Moses usually calls angels, and they are souls hovering in the air. Of course, Philo is not going to have the same angelology as we do in the Christian tradition. That's granted. But the point here that Philo is making is that there was some kind of interaction between, some kind of sensual interaction between angels and women. So all that to say that it's in the tradition, it's in the history, um, and it's, it's, it's one of the conclusions that people have come to you know, between texts like Genesis 6 and Numbers 13 to explain why the Nephilim, you know, uh, 
persevered, as it were, through the flood. These were uh, iso the creation of the Nephilim were isolated events that occurred uh, by virtue of the promptings of evil angels uh, and their power over certain women from men, certain daughters of men. A at least that's what some have have thought. I'm just offering that as a possible explanation. I'm not saying that this is this is it. This should be dogma, um, but it's out there. Uh, another one that that is out there is that perhaps the you know the the G, the kind of genetics of the nephilim survived through noah's son's spouses or something like that that's 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 a possibility as well but uh we don't have to get off on that too much it's just to say that there there are other explanations um that do not require us to localize the flood event um as for uh i think inspiring philosophies claim that there is, if we take the global flood view, that there's a, uh, a contradiction between Genesis 8-5 and Genesis 8-8-9. Eight, eight uh, I don't think there's a necessary contradiction there at all. I, I've already kind of addressed this. Uh, you know, the, the mountains appeared with the recession of the waters, but were perhaps too distant for the birds to fly there alone. Uh, in verse 13, it says that the waters dried up from the earth. Uh, you know, one of the things that inspiring philosophy wants to say is, well, if you take that too literally, then you have to include the oceans. And obviously, we still have oceans. And so, therefore, the ocean, not all water dried up from the earth. So, there has to be local implications here. Um, we have to remember that, like, back in Genesis 1, 9 through 10, uh, there is a distinction made between the earth and the sea. And so, all that the Bible is communicating by, by, by telling us that the water dried up from the earth is that all of that area that is is created as earth and is termed earth back in Genesis 1 and and is distinct from the sea is now exposed once more and has and has now and has now become dry. In fact, it's called the dry in uh, Genesis 7:22. And so um yeah, there's no no necessary contradiction there at all. Uh I I think that the reference from Josephus is a weak reference. Uh I I don't think that there's anything there that constitutes historical precedent, and and even if there were, it's Josephus. He's not part of the Christian tradition, so while he may be helpful, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give his opinion uh, so much weight. Um, there, there are Christians, however, and I think the, the, the wide majority of historical Christianity has come down on a global flood event. Augustine, for example, uh, commenting on the language, they shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Uh, he says, the apostle Peter saith this openly, by the word of God, the heavens were of old. He hath said then that the heavens have already perished by the flood, and we know that the heavens perished as far as the extent of this atmosphere of ours. So he's saying that the floods were up, you know, quite high. For the water increased and filled the whole of that space in which birds fly. Thus perish the heavens that are near the earth, those heavens which are meant when we speak of the birds of heaven. So, obviously, Augustine believed in a scale of the flood that's much larger than a, you know, Middle Eastern locality. John Gill says, and every man, commenting on the language, every man, except those in the ark, he says, and the number of them is supposed uh, to be as great. Let me go ahead and bring this up. I actually have this. As great, if not, let me let me start over. And every man except those in the ark, and the number of them is supposed to be as great, if not greater, than of the present inhabitants of the earth. By those who are skillful in the calculation of the increase of men, it is thought it may be easily allowed that their number amounted to 11 billion. So Gill is saying here that those who have calculated this in the past uh, believe that there were 11 billion people on the earth uh, prior to the flood, and some have made their number to be 80 billion people. Prior to the flood, of course, there's all sorts of explanations as to why that might have been longer lifespans, um, uh, more consistent, you know, uh, reproduction, uh, marriages, even polygamy that was going on that that perhaps made this a, a quicker process. Um, the Apostle Peter, he says, calls them the world of the ungodly. And that's right. The Apostle Peter does say it's the world of the ungodly that perished. Um, and so uh, Gil, Augustine. I think we could just, we could throw a dart at, you know, a dartboard with a bunch of theologians pinned to it and, and hit a theologian that would art articulate a global flood. 
And, and so that's why I said earlier, like it really takes the assumption that that science, that the that the natural sciences, like like archaeology or something, is forcing us to conclude a local flood event. I don't think that that's the case. And, and again, if, if it comes to you know the science of theology and the science of archaeology, what must be allowed to correct the other uh, is theology. Theology must be allowed to correct uh, archaeology or geology or, or or what have you. So looking at the second argument, the argument from uh, multiplying miracles, uh, I think inferring explanations for how things happened in Scripture is legitimate. Um, I think it's a legitimate exe exegetical technique, even um, especially when it's a good and necessary consequence or inference from the text. That's not to say that we should just like punt to miracle every time we see something that's odd in the text, but I, I also don't think that it's unwarranted to, to take sure texts um, that are very plain, very clear, which I think the universal language between Genesis 6 through, through 10 is, is very clear. Uh, I, I don't think it's wrong to draw some inferences about, you know, what that means for how animals got to the ark and things like that. I, you know, I, I just don't think that's inappropriate at all. I think, you know, when it, let's, let's, let's think about the, uh, let's think about the, uh, the resurrection, you know, when we're, when we're talking about the resurrection, um, we're talking a, about a, a very clear miracle, um, but we're also talking about a, a very difficult thing. I mean, you think about, you know, when people die, people who have died thousands of years ago, uh, who died in the Messiah, uh, in the case of Old Testament saints who died in Christ, uh, in the case of New Testament saints, um, their bodies may not even, like, at a material level, may not even exist, right? And so... We have to posit the explanation that, well, well, God is able to, we know that, you know, patterned off of Jesus's resurrection, that the same body that went into the tomb is the same body that walked out, right? And so we have to conclude, if he's the pattern, we have to conclude that these bodies, at least in substance, are going to be the very same bodies in which we are raised. There has to be a way in which God does that, <coughs> miraculously. And so I don't think it's wrong to... to to draw inferences like that from the text, when the text forces you to draw an inference like that. Um, so this is, Gavin's argument is argument from the multiplication of miracles. It, it is thought that the more miracles that are necessary to explain the scope of the flood, the more unlikely that scope. However, I think we could turn this around on its head. I think we could turn this around on its head. We could turn it around for a local flood. For example, how are the waters confined? Um, why is, why is our population not more dense than it is, right? If you have 11 billion to 80 billion people walking around on the earth before the flood and it's only a local flood, so it doesn't kill all of them. So let's assume that like a good, you know, 5 billion people might still be around after the flood. <laughs> um, okay. Let's, let's, let's go with an even more conservative number. A billion people might still be around. I think. I think the growth in population would be much more than it is now. We're sitting at around, what, 8 billion people? Something like that. Maybe between 8 and 9 billion people now. Um, I, I, think, I think that the amount of people in the world would be a lot greater if, you know, a significant amount of people were left after the flood. Um, if, if, if the flood hadn't brought the, the world to a, a family of eight... I think there would be a lot of people, a lot more people on the earth today than there, uh, than there is. Um, there's all sorts of questions we could ask about that, but 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 my point is, a local flood would take just as much explanation. I think um, a, a local flood would take just as much explanation. A flood that is is local, but nevertheless large enough to take up the the greater Middle Eastern region. Uh, as well as perhaps some parts of Africa, uh, you know, Gavin mentioned the Black Sea and even the Caspian Sea. Like you're looking at a massive region, like what contained the waters, right? And so, you know, there's, there's all sorts of explanations that need to be marshaled for that. But when we're looking at these multiplication of miracles, you know, on the transportation of animals to the ark, um, 
a lot of again a lot of people scratch their head when they think about the transportation of animals to the ark i want to i want to actually look at this for a little bit we we have to understand uh, that the flood especially if it's global was absolutely cataclysmic on numerous levels it wasn't just cataclysmic in the ter- in the sense of a lot of water i mean that's cataclysmic enough it was cataclysmic in the sense that there were violent rapidly developing geographical events and geological events taking place at the same time. So, for example, we have in Genesis 8 2 the fountains of the deep. Um, the fountains of the deep, where you have what appears to be water coming out of the ground, um, there, there's an actual uh, geological, um, hydrological explanation for that. Uh, it's a process called continental subduction, which happens today, but it happens at a very uh, slow pace. Uh, but continental subduction, which would have occurred more rapidly than usual during the time of the flood, would result in any subterranean water that would have been subject to the, uh, the weight of an entire continent coming down what does water do? Like, have you ever had a, a cup of water? Like, if I have a cup of tea, right? This is this is my tea. And if I were to put, like, um, another maybe smaller cup into it and, and push that cup down, a bunch of tea would gush out of the side, right? Because it's subject to that pressure. Water that is subjected to the pressure of a single continental plate during continental subduction at, at, at a rapid rate would result in that subterranean water to project over 100 miles into the Earth's atmosphere. you got to think about the pressures happening here and the the cataclysmic forces taking place here. Um, Some think that even as we look at the moon, we realize that the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. That means that the, the face of the moon that you see every night is the only face of the moon that you'll ever see, right? The dark side of the moon will never see that from Earth um, because the moon is tidally locked to earth. We always see one side of the moon from our perspective. Incidentally, um, some of the largest craters on the moon are earth facing. And uh, there's a lot of explanation as to why that might be the case. One of the explanations is that because of this um, continental subduction and the pressures created would have resulted in the projection of uh, earth debris into outer space, out of out out of our atmosphere, away from our gravitational pull, uh, into outer space, and would have resulted in uh, moon impacts. Um, Danny Faulkner wrote an article called A Biblically-Based Cratering Theory, Cratering cratering Theory Having to Do with the Moon. Um, and so check that out. Um, again, that's by Danny Faulkner. If you search it on Google, A Biblically-Based Cratering Theory, you'll be able to find it. Um, now, with all that cataclysm taking place, uh, what the Germans would call a chaos kampf, um, th- this would this would entail the the creation of gaps between our present continental land masses. So I'm not I'm not saying that it would be Pangaea per se before the flood, you know, where all the land masses were were together uh, in like a perfect unity. I'm not saying quite that, but our land masses would have perhaps been uh, more more contiguous than they are today. Um, before the flood, and then because of the cataclysmic pressures going on with rapid continental subduction, uh, that would have resulted in gaps being widened between these 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 continents, um, perhaps even to their present extent. <clears throat> and so, before the flood, you would have had a more contiguous landmass enabling the transportation of animals. That's where I'm going with all this, is that before the flood, the Earth... And, and I mean the earth in contrast to the sea, in distinction from the sea, the earth would have looked a lot different. Um, it, it would have looked a lot different. And there's there's been a lot of things that, that have changed as a result of, you know, things like continental subduction, earthquakes. If there were any heavenly bodies involved in the creation of the flood, some think that the, uh, uh, the meteorite or the asteroid impact in the Gulf of Mexico happened in parallel with you know, at the same time as as the flood event, so that would have created obviously a bunch of upheaval. We don't know all the secondary means that God used to create the flood. We do know about the 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 fountains of the deep, which is a massive geolog- geological uh, event. 
had to have been that would have resulted in uh, perhaps splitting of the land mass and, and before that the land masses would have been more contiguous enabling animal transportation we don't thinking about animals and why they would have traveled to the ark um, you know we, we may just have to punt to to uh, to miracle for that um, and so you know so be it uh, if the text is clear enough that that's what happened then then so be it and I think I think the text is clear enough um, the number of animals on the ark uh, is a problem. One of the issues that, that Gavin sees, the number of animals on the ark requires a heavy explanation, but I, I think it's explained by the heads of families, right? So like the, the, the two animals, the pair, the animal pairs that were taken, the male and female pairs that were taken were the heads of their animal families uh, or their animal kinds. And so it's not like you had to have polar bears and black bears and grizzly bears and koala bears and uh, you know, all these different kinds of bears on the ark as well. You could have just had, you know, two Kodiak bears. And they would have served as the progenitors for further bear speciation. Um, and, and so this would have resulted in a, a, a much smaller number of animals on the ark than perhaps is, has been originally um, thought. And then uh, the rapid microevolution that takes place afterwards that results in today's speciation, which is vast and, and unmeasurable, um, would have occurred because uh, when, whenever you reduce the gene pool uh, in, in any animal species, uh, this happens to some extent with, with humans as well. Whenever the human gene pool is reduced, it seems like there is more of an impulse to, to uh, reproduce. And so when the gene pool the gene pool amongst a species or a kind of of animal is reduced the impulse to reproduce would 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 be present all the more and so you're looking at a reproduction rate that is probably uh you know 10 times or 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 even more uh 10 times more rapid than than one we would see in any normal circumstance so you have to consider those variables. And, and even if you would disagree with that data point, you at least have to consider the, the variable that, you know, animals perhaps bred quicker because of, because of the situation. It was a survival situation. So um, instinctual hyper-reproduction on the part of, of mating pairs, I think, is, is something that needs to be considered. Uh, the care for animals wouldn't even necessarily involve a miracle, especially if the number of animals is whittled down to the heads of families or kinds, so we don't have to multiply any miracles for that. What about the amount of water? The amount of water is a very fascinating question. For years and years, it had been postulated that there, there was subterranean water that was more significant than, you know, regional water tables. And, and that was actually deeper than regional water tables as, as well. But it it wasn't proved. There was a uh, an individual that had um, actually uh, attempted, he actually hypothesized, uh, a gentleman named Ringwood, hypothesized that there was subterranean water perhaps even stored in the Earth's mantle. Um, and lo and behold, recently discovered is a water-rich rich mineral called ringwood. It's been named ringwoodite after the one who, who hypothesized uh, the subterranean uh, water. And this ringwoodite has been discovered at the Earth's mantle, and it confirms, at the very least, it confirms the capacity of the Earth's mantle to house lots of water. Let's say oceans of water under the Earth's surface. So there there's... I think there's even a working scientific explanation for the for the extra water. I don't think we even need to posit an extra miracle, like like that God created water immediately for the flood event. Um, though, you know, he could obviously do that. I'm just saying that there's even a natural explanation for why there could be this much water. Um, and so, uh, again, there's no extra miracle necessarily um, needed uh, at that at that. Point. Uh, the survival of plants and trees would have been possible, um, namely through you know the uh, continuation of seed life. Uh, obviously, seeds would would continue on. Um, there, you know there would be tons of seeds floating around in the in the waters of the flood, and you know then 
the earth would be re re sown with the seeds uh, that were that were tossed around and um, uh, that were tossed around and and uh, transported by the flood. So the flood itself would have worked to redistribute seeds on a global scale. Even think about that on the survival uh, of sea creatures when we're talking about the the merging of uh, you know salt water and fresh water. Uh, it's difficult to know how salty the oceans actually would have been at the time of the flood. Um, and so, you know, that's a variable that we, we, I don't know if we can really nail that down to any sufficient degree of, of certainty. Uh, so let's just grant that it's difficult to actually know the salinity level of the oceans that long ago. Um, it's difficult to know what extent uh, saltwater creatures actually adapted to the salinity of the ocean over the last several thousand years. Uh, so th that's a that's a, a movable variable that is definitely not a constant. It's certainly not a constant, but uh, we don't even know if it's been a constant over the last thousand years, let alone over the last, you know, 4,000 years. Um, but let's assume for the sake of argument that the levels then of salinity in the ocean were identical to the levels today, it's possible that the creatures would have naturally stratified. So once the once the flood occurs and the these waters are all together, uh, it's possible that the creatures naturally stratified, you know, uh, freshwater animals in, in pockets of freshwater, saltwater animals, you know, kind of chasing the saltwater and 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 um, and staying in in more uh, in a more uh, in a higher salinity area. Uh, that's all speculation, of course, but um, it's possible that there could have been natural natural animal stratification along those levels. Freshwater animals staying toward the top, saltwater animals staying lower uh, at lower levels toward the bottom. And you might say, well, all these waters would be mixed up and, and all of the fresh water would be turned into salt water. Um, and so it would be contaminated and all of the freshwater animals uh, would die. Uh, of course, that's assuming that saltwater animals couldn't have adapted over the last 4,000 years to uh, to assume a um, a freshwater environment. Uh, but counting that out, uh, present day estuaries. If you look at a present day estuary, where and an estuary is a place where saltwater and freshwater meet, um, we can gather from present day estuaries that saltwater and freshwater do not mix very well. In fact, if you look at um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, the people who track the weather for us, um, if you look at their website, they, there's a, a helpful article on there called Classifying Estuaries by Water Circulation. And in that article, it is noted that, you know, freshwater and, and saltwater do not readily mix is the language that they use. And so it's possible that even in the midst of the turbulence and in the midst of the flood, that there was some kind of stratification even in the water that animals were able to detect. In any case, some freshwater fish were able to, to make it and some saltwater fish were able to make it. And I don't think that's difficult to explain even from a natural standpoint. So I don't even think we need an extra miracle there. Um. That brings me to the conclusion, really. That brings me to the end of interacting directly with Gavin's arguments. Again, um, I, I think there are implications for denying a global flood, uh, implications that will force us to conclude other things about Scripture that we wouldn't necessarily want to. For example, that Babel was not a global event, that, that the peoples were not scattered all over the face of the earth. And I think that has implications for uh, even for some... Uh, you know, modern scientific theories uh, that are coming out now that suggest that there was a, a large empire uh, that was uh, relatively continuous from one con continent to another with similar customs and similar architecture, uh, similar cultures, um, I think, I think, matches up very well with a pre-flood world, but also matches up very well with a post-Babel world also. So um, I, I find this discussion fascinating. Again, another thing I want to say is that Gavin takes this position, I think, is a mistake. I think it's an error. I don't think it makes Gavin a non-Christian. <laughs> and I think we all need to realize that. Like, if someone takes... Now, I think it starts to get serious. Like, if you take an old age position on the earth... 
uh, by itself, I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't think you are a heretic. It starts to get more serious when you begin to deny, you know, the historical Adam and Eve, because now you're playing with the words of Jesus, right? And, and the things that, and the claims that he made and the way in which he interpreted the Old Testament. And there's implications for the gospel there and all sorts of things, right? Uh, there's implications on the covenant of works and, you know, things of that nature. But like an old earth position by itself, if it maintains the historical human pair, I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to die on a hill with somebody over that. I, I don't think that a person who takes that position is a heretic. And <clears throat> I don't even think a person who takes that position should be put under church discipline or anything like that. Um, again, what makes a Christian a Christian is the gospel. It's not what you think about uh, the age of the earth. Um, that said, I am a young earth creationist. I think that the earth is between six to 10,000 years old, roughly. Um, and I think the Bible is clear about that. Um, and I don't think, you know, the natural sciences c contradict that as much as someone would like to think they do. Um, so I, I, I think I think Gavin is is a, a dear brother in Christ. I appreciate a lot of the things that he has has done in terms of his content creation. Uh, and so I just wanted to say that once more. Uh, the other thing I would like to do just to wrap up here is look at some more constructive aspects. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's some implications for some of the things that, uh, that Gavin argues that have implications on what I'm about to go over here, but this is going to be less of an interaction with Gavin Ortland and more of just an interaction with a, a broader redemptive historical understanding of the Holy Scripture. And so the first thing I want to look at is Noah as a second Adam. I think there's a case to be made that there's a, a an Adamic pattern throughout the Old Testament leading up to Christ as the last Adam. So obviously you have the first Adam. Uh, the second Adam would be Noah. And then the third Adam would be a corporate Adam would be Israel. Okay, so I think there's this Adamic pattern where um, for various reasons, uh, God chooses uh, new Adams uh, namely, I think for the purposes of, of revealing to man how serious their sin is and, and how, how much it is the case that they cannot redeem themselves and how much they must be looking forward to a true last Adam who will rede redeem them. So I think all of these Adams in the Old Testament, all these Adams, are typological. Uh, they were never meant or intended to bring you know, final redemption or anything like that, but they were, they were there to typify the Redeemer. So I think Noah is one of those Adams. Um, we know, of course, that the first Adam obviously typified Christ. We see that in Romans 5.14. The first Adam is a type of the last Adam. He was a type of the one who, who was to come. Um, if we're looking at the flood narrative, the, the, the flood or the deluge— uh, represents an uncreation and recreation. Uh, the, the whole context of the flood is God's quote-unquote regret, um, and and that is on account of man's disobedience. Of course, insert our theology proper here and condition how I mean regret there. Uh, don't, don't jump on me. You know, you know I understand it in the way a classical theist should. So, um, so the flood, the deluge, represents uncreation and recreation, making Noah a second Adamic figure, right? He is the he is the patriarch who is who is there at recreation, and I think that really becomes clear when we consider the fact that there's a recapitulation of Genesis one twenty two and Genesis nine one after the flood. So Genesis eight and Genesis nine is kind of the Noahic covenant area, and. Genesis 1.22 is where God issues the ma mandate to Adam to be fruitful and multiply, right? Well, that appears, that mandate appears once more in Genesis 9.1. Now, it's framed in such a way to take human sin into account. So, it's not a, it's not a 100% identical recap of Genesis 1.22. But as far as it goes, it is a recap of Genesis 1.22. It says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's language lifted right out of Genesis 1.22. And so I think that enough, that 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 text enough is enough to, to actually invite us to consider Noah as a second Adamic figure. 
Uh, and of course, that ties Noah into this redemptive narrative as a whole, um, and and it, it it indicates that he's another Adam. Um, and it's only consistent then, if that's the case, it's only consistent to consider him as the father of all the living. Right? He's got to be another Noah, uh, another Adamic figure. He's got to be the head of the human race. Um, given the fact that the flood narrative is an is a is a uncreation and recreation. I think it's appropriate to see that parallel between the first Adam and the this the second Adam, this Noahic Adam. In Genesis 10, 32, we read, These were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations in their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. And so if Noah is the second Adam... The implications, there, there's some kind of serious implications for denying the global nature of the flood. If we deny the global nature of the flood, we would have to deny, if we, if we didn't, let me put this another way. If we denied the global nature of the flood, along with, den, along with affirming other humans living and surviving the flood that were not on the ark, I think we have to deny Noah as a second Adam. And I think if we deny Noah as a second Adam, there are implications for that that are are quite severe. Um, Noah would not be the only progen the only progenerating Noah and his family would not be the only progenerating humans on Earth after the flood, uh, and that that would be if Noah is if Noah and his wife is to be a second Adam and Eve to deny the global nature of the flood and to suggest there are other humans would be similar to saying that Adam and Eve, the first Adam and Eve, were just two humans amidst a group of humans. And it would be to que to bring into question the uh, the reality of the first human pair. Okay, um, And so I think if we're going to say that the first Adam and Eve were the first human pair, then we need to be able to say that the second Adam and Eve were the first human pair after the flood. Okay, I think I think that's I think that's the biblical flow, and I think that's what we have to do. Um, uh, I want to switch gears here for a little bit and go to the New Testament. We want to look at some things that the New Testament says. Uh, one of the things that I, I you know, Gavin didn't interact a ton with the New Testament and what the New Testament says about the flood. So I want to interact a little bit uh, with what the New Testament says about the flood. Um, the first thing that that I gather from the New Testament is that the flood has to have a universal scope. Uh, w and one reason for this is Hebrews 11.7 uses the word world, cosmos in the Greek, um, and, and it does so quite absolutely. Uh, and it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith condemned the world. Did he condemn the whole world or only some? <laughs> uh, so you see what I mean. Um, why did only some people suffer the wrath of the flood if the flood is the condemnation of the whole world? Um, there, are, there are other things. You know, uh, Peter, uh, this kind of gets us into typology, um, but Peter places the, no the Noahic flood as a type of baptism. He says, um, and this is coming to us in First Peter. Uh, let me pull up my the text here. Um, I think it's First Peter. I of course didn't write down the scripture reference. It said, "For Christ also suffered once for sins." Let me let me do this. I, I really want to be able to cite this. First Peter three. 1 Peter 3, 18 through uh, 22. I'm sorry about that. So uh, in verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. That's an interesting text. Uh, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So if the so number one, one of the things that happens here is Peter only tells us that eight souls were saved through the water. He doesn't say that eight souls plus some. You have to insert that into the text. He doesn't say eight souls plus whoever wasn't affected by the flood. He just says eight souls unqualifiedly were saved through water. If you were to say eight souls plus whoever was outside of the flood waters, that would be to insert something in the text that's not there. Um, and it would certainly be odd to suggest there were others aside from Noah and his family who escaped the flood, given Peter's language. Uh, the other observation that I want to make from that text is, is just as all men perish who are not baptized into Christ, which would be the whole world, those, those who are not baptized into Christ, which is everyone except for those not baptized into Christ, uh, if that's the dynamic, then it seems in order to maintain biblical uh, parallelism, we need to understand that of the flood narrative as well. So just as all men perish who are not baptized into Christ, so too did all men perish who were not baptized through the flood and the ark. All right. So just as all men perish who are not baptized into Christ, so too did all men then perish who were not baptized through the flood in the ark. And then we switch over to Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, we read, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Uh, so a couple observations here. The ancient world. Archeo Cosmo, um, it was not spared. Uh, and it, it would seem like if, if we were to say that, you know, there were some living outside the parameters of the flood, uh, then some of the ancient world still existed and persevered. But here in Second Peter 2, I, I think it's pretty decisive that the ancient world was not spared. They just were not spared. Uh, and the second observation is uh, the flood was brought upon the world of the ungodly. So one of the things that I want to say here is that all those who are born in Adam are ungodly. And I'm talking about the first Adam. They're ungodly. Everyone descended from the first Adam are ungodly unless they are found by faith in God. All right. Um, like Noah and his family. Noah wasn't spared because of his own righteousness. He was spared because of God's mercy and favor toward him. Um, everyone descended from Adam is, we learn this in Romans 5, everyone descended from Adam is ungodly. And so, if the flood came upon the world of the ungodly, then everyone born in Adam, except for those who found favor with God, which was only Noah and his family, everyone born in Adam had to have perished. And this prevents the flood from being local, at least in terms of humanity, because all humanity had to have been destroyed. All the ungodly. It comes, it, it comes upon the world of the ungodly. Uh, that's what we read in 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5. Um, and so uh, if we were to say that you know some of the ungodly survived, could we say that the flood was an accurate, administration of justice um, based on the fact that all men are descended from Adam <coughs> in, in the fallen Adam and they are ungodly on that basis. Uh, well, I don't think we could. I think in order for it to be an accurate administration of justice, all humanity, except for those who found favor in, in God through the coming Messiah, is, uh, is, is necessary. I think we have to say that. Um, there's so much more that could be said on this. An hour and 43 minutes is not enough. Uh, this is one of the longest videos I've made in a, in, in a while. And so all I want to say, I want to say this to close up. I very much appreciate Gavin for making this video in order to provide this dial, the opportunity for this dialogue. So 
So thank you, Gavin Ortland, for that. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you being willing to make arguments from the text that are not um, are not popularly supported, uh, at least among certain uh, demographics. I, 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 I think that that is commendable um, because you are, are willing to stand for what you believe is true. I do think you. I do think you have. Um, I, I do think you've got this one wrong, brother. And so I, uh, I, I was grateful for the opportunity to be able to interact. And I, I hope that this was. I hope that the content in this video was was at least um, approaching uh, the thoroughness that you always provide in your videos. And and I do hope that it it gave you some things to think about. Um, and, and I also hope that it was helpful for, uh, you know, uh, moving discussions like this forward. Uh, another reason why I wanted to make this video is because I, I really wanted to, um, to show other brothers, um, that it, it is possible to interact with, uh, someone who disagrees on issues like this, uh, in a way that is, um, uh, perhaps free of some of the vitriol and, and, and some of the things that you encounter online. And so ho hopefully this was a charitable interaction as well. And, and uh, I, I just, I, you know, Gavin, I, I, I hope the best for your channel. And um, uh, I hope we can even continue this discussion. Again, I thank you for the opportunity. If you are watching this YouTube channel, click the subscribe button and the bell for continued notifications. And if you're listening, thank you for tuning in. If this helped you, maybe it'll help someone else. Feel free to share it. God bless. Have a wonderful rest of your day.